Okay, we are recording. We're live. This is Stefan Kinsella. I'm doing a Kinsella on Liberty podcast. Usually, it's just a re it's just a rebroadcast of my interviews on other shows. And every now and then, I will talk to someone else. This is maybe the third or fourth time I've done this out of 300 or so episodes. So I've got on online with me Steve Mendelson, an old buddy of mine, old patent lawyer friend, old patent lawyer colleague, kind of mentor, um, and Philadelphia, or what do you call it? You don't call it Philadelphia. What do you call it where you live? Philadelphia. Well, I live outside of Philadelphia. Yeah. Outside Philadelphia, right. This is uh, Penn Valley. Penn Valley. Uh, no, what's the train stop on the main line that you use? Narberth? That's my stop, it's Narberth. Not, you're not Narberth. Same zip code, but different name. Yeah. So you're in the, in the peaceful suburbs of Philly. It is very peaceful. I'm on my back porch right now. And luckily, they stopped mowing next door, so it's quiet. And how's Philly doing lately? Uh, I wouldn't know. I haven't been there much in the last uh, five or six months. I've been to my office three times since March 15th, twice to see so new office space. Philly. Okay. Yeah. 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 We're, but we're, our lease is running out, so we're looking for new space. What are you going to do? Uh, well, we're going to have fewer people because everybody's gotten used to working at home. So they're probably going to, we're going to offer people that op option to continue. So we're just going to have a smaller footprint downtown and, uh, see how it goes. Why would your footprint be downtown? If you need a little footprint on occasion, why not just make it in some cheaper location or something? Because we have, uh, staff and lawyers who live on all sides of Philadelphia in Jersey, North, South, West. So it's it. the Got central it. location now, Got it. unfortunately, but that's the way it is. It is what it is, as they say. I love that expression. Yeah. I heard it's Michelle like Obama say it yesterday. Michelle Obama said it yesterday. Um, okay, so let me just tell people what so usually I talk about intellectual property, <laughs> and you're actually a patent lawyer, and we're not going to talk about that today. But maybe next week or so, you and I and our, another fellow colleague are going to talk about patent law. That'll be fun. Um, every now and then I deviate into other topics, cool. usually libertarian-related ones or Austrian economics, and uh, but sometimes it gets into philosophy. I And I, as I mentioned to you, I try not to talk because when you said let's talk about faith and, and free will – First, I thought you meant for a podcast, and I thought, well, I don't usually do podcasts on things I don't think I'm an expert on. But I know enough to have an interesting conversation, and some people might want to hear it. Um, so it you have a book. Let me just share this. Yeah, right? the, the lack of ex yeah. expertise didn't keep me from writing a book about it. I know. I know. I, believe me, i got lots of libertarian friends who do that kind of thing, too. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> share screen. I'm going to share my screen. Just to show your book, um, so yeah. you self-published a book, which is not a, uh, you know, that used to be. Uh, so here it is, shallow. How would you pronounce Dra it? Drafts. Drafts. Shallow drafts. Shallow drafts. Faith in the absence of free will. Um, and you and I've had some email and some phone conversations over the last few years um, about this issue. Yeah. Um. Um. I think we both read. Uh, What's his name? Her uh, Harris's book, Sam Harris's book on free will. Yeah, right? free will, absolutely. And I read lots of other uh, perspectives on that too over the years. Uh, in fact, this issue for me has always been one of the most perplexing in all of philosophy. I think I've come to a sort of approach to it that works for me, which is sort of my own kind of cobbled together. I call it Austrian uh, Misesian compatibilism. You know kind of borrowing on the dualism of the methodology of Mises and the Austrians um, with some of the conceptual insights of Ayn Rand, um, but also with a realist attitude about causality. I mean, ultimately, I don't believe there is true free will. I think that we're either causally determined or that, or that we're random. Either way, there's no room for free will. Or a but mix. It's still meaningful. It's still meaningful to talk about choice in an economic uh, and in a sociological sense. Uh, so that's kind of my wrapper of what I think. But you wrote the book, or a book, and 
this is your first book. You just have another book that came out. I, I just released the second book. Yep. Yeah. How'd you find the Amazon uh, process? Because I just published uh, something on there too. I love it. It's great. This is actually, Shallow Drafts is actually in its uh, fourth edition because, um, well, I screwed up the first one completely, but then I had additional things to say and I found additional quotes to add. And it's so easy just to spit out another edition. I had I read a book by uh, somebody a while back and I reached out to him because I had found a typo uh, and I had some questions to ask him about the substance of his book. And he said, thanks for pointing out the typo, but since his publisher is never going to issue another edition, there's no point in, in, in keeping track of those things. But with, with Amazon, find a typo, yeah. spit out a new edition. Yeah. Well, and of easy. course, it has implications for copyright law because in the old days, there was all these re rights that would revert back to the author if the book was so-called out of print or something for a certain amount of time. But now that means nothing with on-demand publishing. Like, yeah, it, co it, it costs zero upfront. I didn't have to pay a penny to Amazon. Anytime someone orders a book, including me, you just pay for that book. And uh, no, but what I mean is, if you if you're an author. You could count on getting the rights back if your if your book went into dissuade too. You know, oh, you I see. Oh, but okay. Now, now you don't have a publisher. <laughs> I'm the so publisher. You don't have to worry about that. Yeah, right, and you don't have to worry about editors either. <laughs> well, and you don't have to worry about the, the, the delays and also the the effect of censorship, right? I'm gonna I'm gonna do a, I'm gonna show you a cool thing about Zoom. You can do your own background. Can you see my? Yes, I, I know. I could. Uh, yeah. That's my front yard, actually. So I'm sitting here looking at that front yard. Wow. It's my bedroom. Very See nice. Cool technology is, Steve? That's a nice front yard, too. They got a big park this across is, uh, the street. This reminds me of the stuff that we learned when we did Intel patents. Remember about block, block, uh, right. blocks of video and <laughs> difference in coding? Uh huh. Uh huh. And just, to tell, just to tell people here. So you're a couple years older than me, and you were like a, a couple years older, than, uh, more experienced than me at the, at the law firm in Philadelphia, right. Schneider, where I joined in 1994. And you kind of, you did help guide and mentor me on some patent law stuff, which I appreciated. Um, gave me some good tricks, some good ideas, some good techniques. You, you, you probably still use them to this day. Yeah, might even have one or two new ones since then. I don't know. Well, now the funny thing is, you know, now that we're older, Lots of the patents I wrote back in those days, now they're public domain, right? They're, yeah. they're, they're all expired. So it's like, Absolutely. hey, if I messed up, it's too late now for anyone. To <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, okay. Tell me what you uh, – tell me what – so let me ask you a question. Your book, uh, why uh, – this is a meta question in a way. Why didn't you – did you put a free PDF online as well as what you've done on Amazon? So what do you have, a Kindle and a print version on, on Kindle? The Amazon, yeah, Kindle and print versions, yep. Okay, why not Why not post the, the you have the file, obviously. You, have, you yep. probably have a PDF you generate to do this. Yeah, yeah. Why not right post here. that online too? Oh, well. Um, You're not trying to get rich off this, right? No, I, I could. I, I did recently email it to everybody I know. Uh, and attached right. Why not it. Post it online? Why not say, okay, here's Steve Mendelson's book. Here's a PDF version online and even a Mobi or an EPUB version. But if you want to buy it on Kindle, you can. If you want to buy it in paper, you can. Well, you'll show me how to do that. You'll show me how to do that. I can. I can. You can post it for me. I mean, you have a website. You have your law firm's website. I, nothing else. You can have I do have my law firm's like, website. I do have my law firm's so you website. You can make a little subpage. It could be yeah. Mendel IP slash... Steve or something, and then you could put your free ePub books on there. Huh. And post, post the PDF. But then that would be people looking at my website to try to find my book, and that that wouldn't be. Yeah, well, I would do a separate website, but I'm just saying there's one. Yeah. Way to do it. Yeah. You have it's called a landing page. You want a landing page for your site. Landing your page, book. yeah. So you want to tell people, okay, here's my book. If you want more information, go to. Uh, shallowdrafts.com. That's probably not available. Okay. Who, who knows? It might be. I think not it after is. after this thing is published. I think as soon as it's published, <laughs> someone's going to homestead it. And there you go. Try to hit you up for it. Hold me up for it, yeah. Okay, so tell me, so what are your basic thoughts on the, and I don't know if we'll even get to the free will stuff. So let's yeah. talk about uh, the, the faith. Well, so you want to talk about let, faith first, right? Let, let me tell you a story. Can I tell you a story? So I was an undergrad at the University of Michigan studying physics, 
And my uh, housemate, my roommate, Dan, was a dual major, actually. He was a dual major in philosophy and anthropology, which he called majoring in philanthropy. But that's another, that's another story. But anyway, he, Dan I'm made... Of dualism cropping up already. There you go. Dan made the outrageous statement one day that he could do better in an upper-level physics class than I could do in an upper-level philosophy class. And I said, that's ridiculous, Dan. I said, you, you've, you haven't taken the lower level physics classes. You haven't taken the math classes. You couldn't possibly do better in an upper level physics class than I could do in an upper level philosophy class. Philosophy is half bullshit. I've been bullshitting my whole life. And uh, you're on. So I agreed to take uh, 17th and 18th century continental rationalism, epistemology, and ontology with Dan. Uh, like I had an elect, elect, elective or something. Yeah, it not not only was I the only student in that class who hadn't had philosophy one hundred and one, I was the only student that, in that class who wasn't a philosophy major. I had to so go to the professor. There were there were no prereqs for that. You didn't. There to, were like, there were. I had to get permission from the professor to take the uh, class. I didn't tell him about them. The, how did you persuade him to make that mistake? I, I don't remember. I went into his office, and I I, I didn't tell him about the bet. But I, I said, uh, I'd like to take the class. He said, well, what'd you get on your SATs? And I told him, he said, okay, you can take the class. And uh, that was it. So I took this class with Dan and we studied uh, Leibniz and Hume and Berkeley and Spinoza and, and, and Kant. And I, I didn't understand a word of Kant. I'm pretty sure we read him in English, but I still didn't understand a word of Kant. But I picked up a little from Berkeley and Hume. Yeah, yeah. I picked up a little from Barclay and Hume, and I remember writing a paper for that class about describing how I, I go off into the, uh, my backyard, and uh, it's a foggy morning, and I see an animal off in the distance, and it has fox-like characteristics. It looks like a fox, and I believe it's a fox. As I walk closer to the animal, and the fog lifts, and it gets clearer and clearer, some of those fox-like characteristics now appear more dog-like. And now I believe that it's a dog. But my belief in that it was a fox, I didn't control that process of reaching that belief. And I didn't control the process of that belief switching from, from fox to dog. It all happened automatically and involuntarily. I didn't choose my beliefs in the sense of control, consciously controlling the process of going from evidence to conclusion. Yeah, it sounds like you're talking about free will now, not faith, but go, I guess well, that's why they Well, first, so this is just beliefs. I'm not talking about actions, right? I'm talking about beliefs. Well, it wasn't really, be yeah, okay, okay, fine. I'm talking about beliefs, okay? So I, I long have held that we don't choose our beliefs, and I would argue with people uh, wherever I could uh, that we don't control our beliefs. And I would tell people who insisted that they did control their beliefs that, um, they should do an experiment. Okay, I ask them, do you believe that God exists? And they tell me one or the other, yes or no. And I'd say, okay, for the next 36 hours, right. since you control your beliefs, choose to believe the opposite. If you're a theist, choose to believe that God doesn't exist for the next 36 hours. At the end of 36 hours, you can exercise your control again and go back to your previous belief. Well, I never had anybody take me up on that challenge. Uh, well, e either we think the same way and we're both the same kind of smart asses, or I might have got this from you, but I've done the same exact thing. Like, you don't choose your beliefs, and if you think you can, go ahead for, for the next two minutes, believe that the moon is made of cheese, and I'll give you a million dollars. You know, there something you go. like that. And then yep. people say, well, but I sort of think you can choose your beliefs over time. Like, you can sort of brainwash yourself slowly in a sense, and I think some people do that. I used to be one of these atheists who thinks no one really believes in God. They just pretend to. But seeing people fly into the Twin Towers and that kind of stuff, I think they probably do believe it somehow. Um, so, But I don't know. But I kind of think you're right. It's not – action and belief are different things. Belief is what you think is true. Action is what you choose to do based upon your beliefs. Right. right? Something like right. that. Right. So Only just to complete – You don't even choose to do it. Go ahead. Let me, so just to complete the previous story, so I took that class with Dan. Um, he got a B plus on the, the class. I got a B. And then I said, okay, now it's time to take that upper level physics class with me. 
And that's when he wimped out and we ended up taking Astronomy 101 together instead as a compromise. But um, in any case, I've been thinking about and, and writing on a score. What happened? <laughs> we, in, in Astronomy 101, we both got A's. So <laughs> I let him off well, the hook. Well, I think philosophy is more rigorous than we engineers would think, right? Uh, it is it is more – and in fact, I think I've heard surprisingly that like philosophy majors, graduates, get pretty high salaries in general compared to what you would think. Like they're – you know, because people know that they're, they're pretty good at logic and thinking and rigor, and uh, it's pretty deep stuff. Um, not that it's a science necessarily or – but anyway, no, it's so. certainly rigorous. I'll give them that for sure. So, um, so over the years, I have been arguing with people, and every now and then writing an essay or two, mainly for my own consumption, um, about my beliefs about beliefs. And I had written one a few years ago, um, in which I got to the point where I said, "Okay, if we don't control our beliefs, and if we always act according to be our beliefs." Doesn't that mean we don't control our actions? Doesn't that mean we don't have free will? And at that point, I said, no, 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 we can't go there. That's not good. Even if it was true, it wouldn't be good for society. We got to pretend that we have free will for the, in order for uh, civilization to continue. And then I picked up Sam Harris's book, Free Will, in which he says, not only do we not control our beliefs, we don't control any of our thoughts, and we don't control our actions. And I said, oh, shit. Sam Harris wrote the book I was going to write, and then some, and, and, and going all the way. And I said, now what am I going to do? So I was kind of deflated because Sam Harris had already written my book. And I was listening to um, um, an audio version of uh, Seawolf by Jack London. And in there, the captain as, of as the ship. Uh, yeah, yeah, well, uh, in that book, the captain goes off on this tirade about how we don't choose our beliefs and we always act according our, to our beliefs, therefore we don't control our actions. And I said, well, shit, if, Sam, if, if Jack London wrote this 100 years before Sam Harris wrote his book, yeah. well, I can write my book. So that's what I did. I wrote my book. I think, um, the, the, frankly, the stuff I say about free will may be controversial, to many people, but I don't think much that is new there. I say things in a different way, um, but the conclusions about free will are certainly in Sam Harris and Jack London and, and many other places. But I think what I have to say about faith um, is somewhat new because what, what, what I, when, when Sam Harris writes a book about the end of faith and um, when, and when, Richard, when, um, uh, Christopher Hitchens writes a book about um, faith. These, these guys are my heroes. But when they write about faith, they're denigrating religious faith. And to me, the psychological process by which we come to acquire... Wait, wait, wait hold on. You, you mean, so l let's be clear for a second. You're talking yes. about the four, what they call the four horsemen, these kind of new atheists? Yeah. And Hitchens, Harris, Dawkins, and Daniel Dennett. Dennett, we, right? we, we, and I've, we'll, read a, I've read a lot of Dennett, by the way. Yeah, well, we'll come back to Dennett because um, he's one of your compatibilists that we'll, we'll, we'll need Correct. to talk but about. But I've I read, I read a lot of his stuff on the philosophy of consciousness and that kind yes. of thing. Not, not, yes, yes. Um, he's the co-author of that great book, The Mind's Eye, with, uh, with Douglas Hofstadter, which is one of oh, okay. Yeah, I, I, I read... Uh, dorm room geek out books of all time. I read Gertel Escherbach, and I understood as yeah, much of that as I... Yeah, that's Hofstadter, yeah. Yeah, but I understood as much of that as I understood Kant, so... Well, Hofstadter is one of these... Uh, he's one of these elusive... Um, not gadfly, what's the right word? Like dil He's kind of a dilettante, but a very smart one. Kind of like Robert Nozick. Um, but anyway, go ahead. So, um, where was I? Oh, um, you were getting interested in this, like the implications of uh, your, your oh, basically a pirate. faith, the you faith know. part, yeah. right? Sorry, I was talking about faith. So, um, to me, the psychological process, the, the operation that the brain performs when it generates beliefs is, is the same whether those beliefs are what we call secular beliefs, like 
Shakespeare wrote Hamlet or Oswald shot JFK. And, what, do you mean and, the same? what do you mean by that they're the same? Okay. Because they're operating according to the laws of physics? Yeah, but, but also according to the laws of psychology. Our brain is performing a process that I call automatic, involuntary, subjective evidence weighing. A-I-S-E-W, which I pronounce ASO. Automatic, involuntary. Our brains are organs operating according to the rules of physics and chemistry and biology, just like our hearts and our guts and our what eyeballs, whatever, are operating according to physics and chemistry and biology. Yeah. And they're just, they're just do, the brain's doing its brain thing. It's automatic and it's involuntary. And some of the things that it does is generate thoughts and beliefs and consciousness, yeah. and we can talk about that. But um, it's just doing its thing automatically and involuntarily. And what it's doing is it's, it's weighing the evidence that it has acquired over time. And it's doing it subjectively because everybody's brain is different and whatever. Uh, see, okay, yeah, no, okay. Let me just, for a second, uh, we could keep going, but we can, there are several terms you're using that I think part of the problem with these discussions is people don't define their terms. Okay. So free will needs to be defined, right? And choice, maybe they're different concepts, right? Yes, also, yes. So faith needs to be defined. And even the word, what was the word you just used? Um, Automatic, uh, involuntary, subjective. Evidence? Subjective. Subjectivism needs to, because that's used in different senses, like by economists and by ethicists. Um, okay. Well, so, what, but, but go ahead. When, when, I, when I mean subjective, I mean that everybody is different. When I look at a tree in my... But that's not what, in, subje that's not what subjective means. I mean, well, do, you, do you mean relative or do you mean, what do you, what do you mean? I mean, well, let me, let me finish my set. When I, when I used to, when I looked at a tree before, people would tell me, look at the magnificence of trees. That has to be evidence for God's existence. And I looked right, at those right. trees and, and in years past, to me, that had probative value to supporting the conclusion that God exists. <laughs> it, but hold on, hold on. You're using a legal, I mean, okay. So no one normal would use the word probative. Okay, this is a legal term. It's not <laughs> okay. a physics term. Point, pointing it's not a to. philosophy term. Point, pointing to. It has, it, it, it tends Support to of, Look, I, I, I talk about a scale, okay? Or we have a scale. Sometimes the scale I has know. more than two sides. Sometimes the scale has two sides, right? God exists, God doesn't exist, okay? There's the scale. And there's evidence that could potentially be on either side of that scale. People look I at... Know, but, 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 but that whole way of describing it takes for granted a whole framework of looking at the universe, which is, I think, basically empiricist and logical positivist, right? It's, mo it's what I call monist. That's why I said dualism early on. I wasn't quite joking. I mean, if, uh, but... When I think Wait. you're you're taking for granted a lot of things. You're taking well, let me take a step back then. A lot of things. Let me take a step back. When you say dualism, you mean mind body, right? We got these two things. Well, is that would not mean by exactly, dualism? but it, it it relates to that. Dualism means um, that we understand the universe in terms of concepts. We we higher level cognitive intelligent human, you know, Homo sapiens. We're not animals on the lower level, which are basically instinctual or whatever, uh, or, or even more automatic, like the cricket with mass ganglia or whatever they have instead of brains. Um, we take the evidence of the senses, which you that's what you were kind of referring to in your own, I'm not saying made up language, but you know, in philosophy, this is called the perceptual realm, right? So we have percepts, we have we have evidence of the senses. We we sense things about the universe. And now, according to like the way Ayn Rand and some of the realists like would look at it, our our brains organize this sense data into higher level concepts to have a higher level understanding of the causal aspects of what's going on in the world. So that's how we understand and frame and think about the world. Now, even if we don't have free will and we're just a pilot in this little airplane riding around the world on this you know sea of foam. We still understand the world in terms of concepts, and because we perceive ourselves as having choice and values, and we perceive other humans as being similar to us, we seek to 
frame them and categorize them and understand them in these conceptual terms in ways similar to us. So we think of them as having choice and making choices and having purposes. So it's the teleological realm versus the causal realm. The causal okay. realm would be the realm of physics, and that's what you study with the, the methods of the natural sciences. But you have to study the teleological realms with a different methodology, which I, which is what – that's what I mean by dualism. That's what Mises meant by dualism. You have a – you understand there are two realms of knowledge in the world. One is understanding human teleology and purposes, which would relate to economics and human interrelationships and social things, even law. Uh, and then science or the sciences, right, the natural sciences, which goes back to causality, and and to me, the compatibilism I believe in is that, yeah, in essence, we are determined or we're random, either one. I think we're probably determined because I don't believe in this quantum randomness stuff, but I could be wrong. But either way, it, it doesn't leave room for true free will, but it, it still leaves room for choice as a category or mode of, of explaining the teleological – like you, if you want to tell me you bought a brand new Mustang car, you're telling me as another human, you're communicating some information to me about a fact about the universe that you have a car, but you're calling it a car. So you're already organizing these different quarks into certain subgroups, right? And according to the function and the purpose that you imbue upon them and society imbues upon them, like there's a brake, there's a clutch, there's a there's a transmission, there's a electrical system you know god could probably look at it as a bunch of clouds of atoms and understand everything but we're not god right and all, no one's god <laughs> all so, i'm saying I mean? so, so, that, all i'm saying is whatever those processes are that you just described right or wrong whatever they are they happen automatically and involuntarily Okay. Well, they happen, Whatever. That's in the that's in the physical realm. They happen automatically and physically in the physical realm. But if you think of your 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 children or your friends or your wife or yourself, you conceive of what you do in 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 the language of of teleology of purposes, right? You say like, why why did the guy rob the bank? Because he wanted to do this. Like he had a goal in mind, and he chose the means at hand to do it. That's a perfectly reasonable way of explaining what he did, even if on the causal side we don't really have free will. right? I could be wrong about this. This is my compatibilism, which is always awkward. I mean what's the solution to this? To be a monist and to believe only in determinism? And then what's the point? So let's say you prove that we all have – we don't have free will. So even your inquiry was determined from the beginning of time, and whatever you're going to decide based upon this conversation or later in your life is equally determined. Or right? random. Or somewhat random. Either way, either way, uh, there's nothing it, you can do about it. I, you got it. That's right. By the way, by the way, there's a recent – this is a total aside, but there's a science fiction series that just came out a couple months ago on a Hulu FX called Devs. You've got to watch this, Steve. Yeah. It'll blow your mind. You will love it. Have you heard about this? No. It's about all this stuff. It's about physics, free will, compatibilism. Uh, it's crazy. It's crazy good. One of the best TV shows I think in a way I've maybe ever seen. Crazy. But go ahead. So and he's what parallel universes, you know, the Everett hypothesis that there's many worlds and every choice breeds. By the way, let me ask you as a physicist, do you think that your your view of physics has uh, matters. Like in other words, if you think that we live in a not Newtonian world, but in a deterministic world, or if you think there's a quantum world with randomness at the base, do you think that affects your analysis, or do you think it doesn't matter? I think it doesn't matter. I think there yeah. there are people who there are people who argue that quantum mechanics somehow explains free will, and right. and just and I said what? That's the opposite. Quantum mechanics is I randomness. Agree. So how does randomness? Yeah. So yeah. Um, I, I've always oh, agreed with that too. Yeah. I, that's I, and you'll see it in my book. I talk about determinism not being the antonym to free will. It's one possible uh, non-free will existence is determinism, but also 
randomness. Random I happen to right. I happen to believe in you know you said you said Newtonian as if that was separate from determinism, but I equate the two. And to me, our reality is mostly determined with a little bit of quantum randomness thrown in. Um, okay. So you you actually okay yeah. I, I think that might be the case, but I, I tend to believe in determinism down down to the bottom the bottom turtle. Yeah. They are. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't listen, really believe in randomness, but, actually. I, I can't believe in cause because to me randomness means caught randomness really in probability are just measures of ignorance, right? Um, and I don't believe in this height I don't believe in all these the physics physicists who want to become philosophers and they interpret their mathematical models in a certain way. It's fine as a model or as a metaphorical thing, but this stuff about Heisenberg and how um, the observer matters, uh, 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 there's only so much precision in reality because whenever you measure something, you interfere with it, and that means that in reality, I think that's all too much, but I don't know. Well, well right or I wrong, right or wrong, yes or no, I don't think it's relevant to our discussion about free will, because either way, either it's purely deterministic or it's deterministic with a little bit of quantum uncertainty. Um, either way, uh, I don't end up at free will. So well, I'm, let, I'm okay. Let me, let me ask you this. Let me ask you this. How would you handle this argument? Because this is the one argument that a lot of libertarians and a philo libertarian come philosophers try to give um, for free will. Their argument is this kind of proof by contradiction argument, sort of like the Aristotelian argument that, like, uh, you know, for, for some of the basic uh, axioms of philosophy, like uh, the law of, of, of uh, excluded middle or non contradiction or whatever, like, you have to assume the opposite to contradict it. So you're basically, or to, to deny it. So you're basically ending up in a contradiction. So it's a, sort of a proof by contradiction. And the argument is this that when let's say you and i are debating free will and i believe in it and you don't um you're assuming that you're advancing arguments meant to persuade me that you're correct and that i can choose to accept the standards of reason or whatever you're advancing right i no. can choose to evaluate this no. and to decide or not no so you have to stop so, using the so word choose. This argument is that that you have to presuppose free will because no. the very uh, endeavor of trying to argue about it presupposes free will. No, I mean, have you no, heard this no. Yeah, no, yeah, but it's not. It's you, not have that. Have you heard the argument though? You know what I'm talking about. I, I, yeah, I've probably had people say things like that to me. I don't recall yeah, specifically, so but the, our beliefs aren't static because our evidence isn't static. Every moment no, of the no, day. No, the idea is that I know, but hold on. The idea is that. When people give you evidence, you have to choose whether to accept it or no, not. No, that's the, that's the subjective part. That's the subjective part of automatic and voluntary subjective evidence weighing. Our brain assigns weight to pieces of evidence that we acquire. And that, that assigning of weight also happens automatically and involuntarily. If you tell no, me... Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. I would agree with that, but... Do you agree that human knowledge has increased over the last several millennia? I mean, absolutely. Think we, we have more. We have our our evidence is changing all the time. No, no, it's not just evidence. It's the it's, it's the process by which humans choose which they select. Stop. Right? They select. Stop saying choose. Choose is a loaded word, right? You well, wouldn't I say don't, I, I'm you don't talk. Choose instead of I don't know what other word to use. Uh, it's a but problem. The point is. It's a problem with the English language because we have words that themselves presuppose the existence of free will. We don't talk about a we don't talk about a gumball machine choosing which gumball to dispense. Well, I, okay, that's that's funny you say that because there are some. <laughs> maybe it's not you. I thought it was you. There are some patent claims you and I have drafted, or I've seen other people draft. Like there was one I saw where it said. Uh, a the machine believes <laughs> where it wherein it the, the processor believes this to be right. the case and so yes. i know this is the imprecise use of metaphorical language to describe an aspect of the way the thing is is configured see, and set up to work but and that's I think, different i thought you taught me that one time but that's different that's assuming that machines have the same quality as human beings right the, they that's they, they don't 
exactly. And just like computers don't choose or don't believe, they don't exercise conscious control over their no, no, no. operations. But, but you, could see, you could see an engineer setting up a system and he would describe the operation by saying, okay, so if this happens, uh, the, the robot will choose this or that. I mean, he's just trying to use the English language to describe what's going right. on. Right, because we don't um, have good words in the English language that... Well, we also don't have infinite knowledge. We don't have an infinite knowledge like from a God's eye point of view of, of the way the quarks, the quark swarms are going to work out. So we describe it in terms of teleological or purposive actions because that's the right. best way to get a descriptive view it, of what the system is doing. Right. And as you alluded to earlier, and as Sam Harris says, free will is an illusion. Yes, it feels like we have free will, but that doesn't well, mean that actually, we okay, do. Okay, so hold on a second. I, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong on this. I thought I heard Sam say somewhere, or maybe it's in one of his books, I thought he had this whole thing about the illusion of free will is itself an illusion. Like he had this point that, right. that we don't even experience – if you think about it closely for a second, you just examine your experience, it's, there's not even the illusion of free will. Um, in other words, that whole metaphor is what's used – that's used by pro-free will people to denigrate the determinists. Okay, They'll say, well, you just think it's an illusion. But as Sam points, I thought Sam pointed this out somewhere. Maybe you can correct me, but he says that the illusion itself is an illusion because if you you don't actually experience, like you said, it's like you're flying in an airplane. That's the Buddhist in Sam Harris. You're witnessing things rather than choosing. You notice it after it's been done, in a sense, right? Yeah, and I, I, I don't I actually kind of agree with that. I don't recall that in. His book free will it might be there i don't recall it um yeah. but I as i said he's he's a, he's a big buddhist and that sounds like buddhist talk we don't have yeah self i'm surprised you like him because he's sort of on the you know a lot of these a lot of the progressive left which you're sort of kind of leany towards right uh they hate sam harris because of his uh because he's he's realist about muslims right right right, right. well yeah I, I, that, well, you I say hear some people are good on some things and bad on the others, or you're like, yeah, maybe he's not so wrong. Well, I would say that um, we could discuss Muslims and Islam <laughs> in two different, uh, two different ways. Talking about faith. Let's and talk free about will. faith and free will. Right. Basically, that implies a criticism of religion. So, so my point is, is that faith is that process, that process of automatic, involuntary, subjective evidence weighing is faith. Faith is okay. what takes us from evidence to conclusion, right? You, you and I have discussed... Where do you get definition from? I'm, I'm, just, where do you I'm a philosopher. I made it up. Yeah, but that's, you can't just redefine a word. You, I know you can be your own lexicographer in patent law, but I mean, there are limits. <laughs> if you want to communicate with people... See, to, right. to my so, mind, as a, as a sort of logical, rational person, there are two valid means of – there are two means of validating knowledge or having valid knowledge or sound knowledge about the world, okay, let's say. One would be evidence or experience, and the other would be reason, right? And they, they combine. They intertwine, of course, especially chronologically. But because you can't – so a baby can't reason about a gun being pointed at him. He's not afraid of the gun. He doesn't know what the gun is, right? Uh, but after a certain point, you combine these things. You can't have reason without any evidence to fill it. You'd be like a, a brain in a vat with no sensory data. You'd go crazy. But those two combined are the sources of knowledge, reason and evidence. Okay, now, but you, you need to expand. Leanings, so you keep talking about evidence. So you, you, you lean on one of those, right? You need to expand your definition of evidence, though, because most of the evidence that we have in our possession is not what we've experienced. It's what we've heard from others. Well, Most of okay, what we so that's, believe. That's a, that's, a, that's a complicated topic, like historical evidence and things like that. But the point is, the point is, from a from a, from a conceptual and perceptual sense, it's what you what you actually witness and perceive. So that's like raw information you're getting about the state of affairs of the universe. There is some correspondence between the real world and what you're what you're perceiving. 
and then your brain integrates that into higher level concepts, and that's where mistakes can set in. So I would say I agree pretty much with Ayn Rand and her whole philosophy on this that if you perceive something, you can never have a erroneous perception. Um, and now people trot out the thing of illusions and hallucinations as, as counterexamples. I don't think those are counterexamples because you're just not perceiving anything then. But if you're actually perceiving something, then well, that cannot be mistaken. Concepts can like, be mistaken. It's like the animal in the foggy field. It looks like a fox. I perceive no, see, it as your, a fox. Your, no, but that was your see, that was your conceptual level. So you were trying to integrate it into a higher level of classifying the type of right. animal. I, that wasn't right. a first step. Right. I said what was it? What what was it? A fox? What what was it you I, I said I saw fox like characteristics. And my what brain concluded it, it was a I, I made it up. It's not a true story. Okay, but whatever it really was, <laughs> that's what you. My point is, that's what you were perceiving because that's what was right. physically right. causing your your sense receptors to to notice this. So you right. were whatever it was. That's what you were perceiving. Absolutely, I agree. If I see if I see a, a stick in the water and it looks bent. Um, yes. My my conceptual mind is making the mistake of thinking it's bent because I'm trying to go to that level. And that's right. where you can make mistakes. Right. But, but you're perceiving a bend. I'm perceiving the stick, but I'm perceiving the stick in the only form possible given the physics of the matter and the way right. the senses work, the way light waves work, right. the way that all this stuff works. Right. So I'm perceiving the actual stick. Right. I'm just perceiving it in the form. In an unusual form, which confuses my conceptual faculties. Right. So, at the conceptual level, you can make mistakes. But so, but, but my point things. is, all I'm saying is, all of that happens automatically and involuntarily. All that processing well, by our that's brains. That's the free will issue. I agree with well, you on that, but that's the free will issue. Well, so far we're just up to beliefs, right? We're just up to beliefs. So we're not up to actions well, the yet. Question is, but, but, so the question is, what's the word faith and what should it be used for? To my mind, the way I hear it used all the time, basically faith is a third form of – a third source of knowledge which religious people use to justify believing in something for which they have no evidence and no No, reason. no. See, that's unfair. That's unfair. That's where a atheists like you and me – It's unfair because I'm trying to actually – Give a coherent no, definition to the word no, so that we can no, have you, a conversation. You, you are not giving them credit because they do perceive evidence for God's yeah, no, no. They, existence. But, but you don't you not, don't then, you faith. don't give that evidence any weight. You don't give they that don't evidence, evidence any weight, they but they do. Of course What's they do. Evidence? They look at a tree and they say, That is magnificent. That could not have happened randomly that could not have happened without a designer whatever their arguments are they're, 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 hold on that's they're not their... witnessing. so that's so that's not that's not evidence and that's a reason in other words they're, so they're not witnessing god okay here's another piece of evidence so now they're making an argument so they're using okay. reason so the let's take a step is, back argument makes sense somebody once told me that e equals mc squared right i didn't even know what e equals mc squared meant, and yet I believed that e equals mc squared. Why? Because people I trusted told me that that was true. So my belief that e equals mc squared was true, yeah. the evidence that I had were no. the statements made by trusted people. When, yeah, I grew you're, you're up, waiting... when I grew up, I was taught that God exists by people I trust, by my parents, by my clergy, by my siblings by my friends i was told that yeah, god and then, exists and then you grew up yeah then you grew okay up. but that was the evidence that i had that, that was evidence the, it is evidence, evidence. Steve. it's the evidence it's that you have that you base most of your beliefs on what other people have told you what you have read if you believe that shakespeare wrote hamlet you didn't watch shakespeare sit down at a table and write hamlet hold on, you hold don't on. have even that kind I'd of watch, evidence even if i had watched him do it it's, that doesn't prove that he did it i could be fine but it's not it but it's still delicious. evidence of course no, but it's, it's still your I, evidence not, I, I think you're equating the word trust with the word faith which is giving the by the way it's giving the christians and these uh, religious nuts uh, an out Nobody, so no, just no. Say, well, everyone, everyone trusts someone. So no religious not. person, no religious person says, I believe in the existence of God in the absence of evidence. Nobody says I that. I completely and totally disagree. I hear. Have you asked in them? In fact, a lot of have the hardcore ones, they, 
yes, they will say – maybe we talk to different people, but I – or I, maybe I'm missing they say They say it's written in this book. No, That's all the evidence them, you – No, 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 no. Hold on. A lot, well, first of all, they're contradictory, so they will say yeah, things fine. that they contradict. Fine, fine, but, absolutely. But if you ask them – they have you never heard any Christian say something like, well – if you could, if you could prove there's a God, that would that would like uh, make it pointless to have faith in Him, right? right or they, or right. they say, well, God's nature is inherently undefinable, so you, it just has a they, dude. The whole idea of the leap of faith or the act of faith, why why would you say a leap of faith? That's it's exactly not about an authority. That's exactly what the ASO process does. It closes the gap. It spans the gap from evidence to conclusion. When you have a belief that uh, Shakespeare wrote Hamlet and, uh, you know, uh, whoever it is, is Bacon did not write Hamlet, um, there are people who have written uh, books about this issue on both sides. And there's evidence for and there's evidence against. Yeah, and, you, and, and, there's you, no, and, and there's probably, in some of these disputes, there's probably no firm answer that we can ever right. – Because exactly. it's not a repeatable scientific – Exactly. We can't, but that, and it's, but not, that, it's not a process of a priori argumentation where you can prove it by – Right. It's not. It's argument. not. It's based on the evidence in your possession and how your yeah. brain processes that evidence. But some people look that. at the – Some people look at the same evidence and conclude that Shakespeare did write Hamlet. Some people look at that exact same evidence and conclude – the opposite. The the well, Bacon I, wrote uh, Joseph, Joseph but, Sobrin wrote that the Earl of with the Earl of Oxford or someone was really the author of Shakespeare's play. Okay. And I know another guy that said it wasn't Shakespeare, it was just another guy with the same name. <laughs> well, I heard that about uh, about the um <laughs> about Homer. But anyway. Actually there's the, another there's another crazy libertarian named mm -hmm. Alexander Golombos, Al Andrew Golombos. Who argued that Thomas Paine really wrote the Declaration of Independence? It wasn't Jefferson. Well, I recently read. He's got read... some arguments for it. He's basically a conspiracy nut, but there are some arguments. True. But we will never know for sure unless we can uh, get a quantum computer and go back in time and recreate everything. We'll never recent... know for sure. I recently read Thomas Paine's Age of Reason. It's great. Yeah. He's he's a, he's, he's so underrated. Anyway. Back to yeah, faith. He was, he, was, he was weak on intellectual property, I gotta say. <laughs> so back to so he wanted copyright. <laughs> okay. So faith, I anyway. Judge these classical liberals by based on how good they were on intellectual property. There is a process by which we go from evidence to conclusion, because not everything is certain, and yet we form beliefs in the face of uncertainty. And that process of going from evidence to conclusion is what I call the automatic involuntary subjective evidence that our brain performs to process the evidence that we have. It does so subjectively, meaning it's based, yeah. everybody's different, but it happens automatically and voluntarily, and the scale tips one way or it tips the other way based on that automatic processing. Now, I think that's what people call faith. Now, some people, I, you're so, right. Some people. I, I'm with you until that point. And I kind of, okay. I think you're, I think you're. It's a little flip. It's I don't think you're flip. amateur philosophizing it. You're kind of reinventing the wheel, which is what a lot of people do. you got to be careful not to be seen as a prank when you do that. Well, let me say but it this it way. It take a lot of work to go through all the stuff. But when you go to the faith part, you just, that, that's, the, I, I'm with you. Like it's as a, as a loose description of what we do. I would use maybe some slightly different terms, which I've through my reading, but I think roughly you're right. But I would also say that when you when you dismiss it as being automatic, I don't know what that – it's true, but what does that prove? It doesn't mean that our okay. minds don't gradually get better at discovering real – Right. Absolutely. It's not static. It's not static. It's dynamic. It changes well, not that it's static because it has a direction. It has a direction yeah. towards it, truth. Well – uh, maybe in the grand scheme of how things. Can we have, how can we have technological what? advancement if it doesn't have a direction? We, we make mistakes all the time. Cold fusion. I just I read know, a great but, book. But we have a direction. We have a direction. We are more advanced technologically now than we were 100 years ago and 500 years ago, etc. I, I don't know. I think, you know, if you look historically, probably the ancient... Just the ancient well, the ancient Greeks probably had it over the, our Middle Ages. 
but um, they didn't understand the things we understand about chemistry now and and, and okay and, and okay so Dooley's equation and, and I, flight and space travel okay so there's there's a direction fine all I'm saying is it's not static our, our evidence changes all the time and our beliefs can change when our evidence when the accumulated evidence tips the scale the other way that's what happened even to me when I we went from have being free will. right but this is yeah even though this happens Not even, even though, though we don't have free will. Absolutely, because the brain functions automatically and involuntarily. In it's order a survival for survival mechanism, the ones that what? survive, natural selection, the ones yeah. that survive that do better tend to tend to procreate and duplicate themselves. Fine, absolutely. I think we're in agreement. So, but the po the point is that what's the point? The point is that from my perspective, those people who define those religious people who define faith differently from the way I define it, are mischaracterizing the psychological process that's going on in their brains, because they are insisting that they are choosing, and that it's not automatic and involuntary, that it's voluntary, and that it's the result of their exercising conscious control over the process of going from evidence to conclusion. And I say that's wrong. So I like throw it back in their face. Over. Hold on. You're redefining the word faith. Are you going to define the word choose? Yeah, cho choose. Your... Choose. I, I'm saying that's what they're claiming. They're claiming to choose is to exercise conscious control over a selection process. All right. There's a number of options, and you end up with a single selection. Okay. Even that word's a little iffy because these words imply the existence of conscious control. And that's what choice is. Choice implies conscious control. Again, we don't talk about a gumball machine choosing a gumball, right? There's a mechanism in there that's spitting out the next gumball that's sitting ready to be spat out. And that's what our brains do. And there's a whole chapter in my book about how our brains are just like gumball machines. And that's what our brains do. They, they, they process that evidence that comes in uh, and they spit out beliefs. Right. And that's but where I got to. But, but you describe a gumball machine in terms of, I don't know, random or stochastic process. No, no, absolutely not. Or mechanical. No, it's not at random. A gumball machine is not random. If you know no, no, exactly where every gumball is. machine is, if you know where every gumball is in a gumball machine and you understand its mechanism for operation, absent quantum mechanical of quantum mechanical effects, you can predict exactly the sequence yeah, but, of colors yeah, of gumballs. No one ever knows. I, uh, that's, um, um, no one ever knows where every gumball is. Like that's a theoretical possibility. My point is, when you're designing that's not a so hard. machine, you, but you don't need to. You just basically you you use statistics is my point. You use statistics to say, okay, let's arrange it this way, and they're the thing they're gonna fall down this way or what, whatever. That's statistics, physics. I'm thinking of these. I guess I'm thinking of these machine, these games where like there's all these. That's not a gumball machine, right? That's I know. That's I know. you mean I, like I a lottery a, for some reason. A lottery yeah, ball my mind machine. Went to the, my mind went to the machine like in the, in the, in the arcade. Lottery. It's like a vertical wall where there's a bunch of pegs and you drop a disc in. Oh, pachinko. Kind of That's random. pachinko. Pachinko. But, it's the Japanese. But when you design game. the game, you kind of know statistical regularities. You design it in such a way where it's not too easy to win, not too hard. Yeah, but in your, right? in, your, in your Newtonian deterministic world that you believe in, if you knew where you drop that initial ball yeah, yeah. and where the pegs are, you'd know where it was going. I know. I totally agree with that. But the point is you're designing this for human people who are going to put a quarter in to play it, and you want to give them a little thrill, a little experience. And from their point of view, they're not omniscient. They don't know where all the particles are. And so right. for them, it looks random, and so they're taking a guess and whatever. I'm just saying you, you use statistics to design these things. Yeah. But what I'm saying is you don't use anywhere near that kind of model to explain other human beings you interact with and you know. You view them in terms of purposes. Like you assume that people you're dealing with have some purposes in mind. It's not random. Right? It's not random. This ASO process is random or not. This ASO process view, maybe it's random. This ASO process is not random. There are reasons why we come to the conclusions we come to based on our genetics and our history. There are reasons why we have the beliefs that we have. Okay, it's not random. Well, yeah, there's reasons why. Although I will say that as a determinist sort of anti-free will type for all my life, basically, 
I've always disliked the sloppy determinism of the people that say things like, oh, well, you were determined because of the way your mother raised you, like these macro level things. To me, I was always a physics level guy. Like I think it's yeah, from a from, from some subatomic particle level, it's basically all determined by the four laws of physics, right? Something like that. It's mathematical, but it's not because you know of 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 the environment in terms of like your macro environment. Like oh, you were raised Catholic, or your mother had a a guilt complex, or something, because that never is rigorous. Because you'll have twins, right? You'll have twins, and they come out differently, right? They're I not. Mean, they're, they're not the same, same environment. They're not the, it's it's never not the, the same. same but it's only never, never the same. same if you if you go down to the micro never level the same. enough. And my point is, the micro. You don't have level to go very to far. Be. You don't have to go very far, even for twins. I, the, well, that's true, but I still don't think that's the explanation. The explanation has got to be further, further down. Like if you want to go to true determinism. But what does it matter for life? So here's the point. So I, I, I wrote an essay and I said, um, and then I read Sam Harris and he said, yeah, we don't choose our beliefs. We don't choose any of our thoughts. We don't choose our actions. And, and we don't. And so the, implica the implications are that it really is unfair to punish somebody for a transgression that that individual could not control. At the individual you know level, the obvious, you know the obvious counter reply to that. Well, go ahead. Well, if, if everyone's determined and it's because we're determined, it's unfair to punish someone for something they couldn't have chosen to not have done. We can't choose not to punish them either. <laughs> well, if we punish them, it's because we had no choice. But uh it, it was predetermined but this, yeah, so, this you're, so you're you're trying to have it both so, ways in a way well no i'm not i read sam harris and in in sam harris's book free will he talks about this and that was new evidence that i acquired and that new evidence it's made me evidence. also believe it's not evidence i i disagree with that it's, it's, of course it's evidence it's what somebody it's not, told you just, me you just read an argue you read words from someone yes that's that's opinions. that's that's upon which most of our beliefs are based. That's Words right. that we evidence. hear and read from others. So evidence that's what the things you perceive with your senses or that you can replicate. So I perceive your... words. I hear words. That's a perception. Oh, I mean, uh, what are you that's, talking about? You list, list your beliefs. Okay. Do you believe that Seattle's the capital of the state of Washington? Sure. Well, Why do you believe it? Because somebody told you that. You don't know. <laughs> I don't know if that's true anyway, but I think it is. But in any case, well, that, that's a whole, when you say you don't know, that's a whole question about the theory of knowledge. Um, and all I'm saying is require. most of what we believe and most of what we know is based solely on testimonial evidence, not perceptual evidence, testimonial evidence. Yeah, but what Sam said is not testimonial. I, I, I agree with you that in a courtroom, when someone gets on the witness stand and they testify to what they witnessed and they say, this is what happened. That is a type of evidence. It's probative, as you as you might want to call it, as being. Yeah. By the way, were you a philosophy school asshole too, or just a law school asshole? <laughs> I was only in that one class, but uh, it's okay. too. Uh, <laughs> you'll have to explain uh, but that. But I, I don't think that <laughs> the reasoning by some philosopher or thinker. I wouldn't call that evidence, but I know what you mean. I think you're using the term way more broadly than I would use it. Okay, um, I'll accept that. But the problem is that can lead to equivocation because you're sort of adopting the, the, the logical positivist empiricist mindset when you keep boiling everything down to evidence. But then you have to broaden the term of evidence so much to make that fit into your expanded. I'm just talking about what our brains chew on. Our brains chew on our perceptions and they chew on what well, we've you, heard. You, by the way, do you mean our brains or our minds? This is another whole topic. You, well, it is, and it's where my book starts. My book starts but there. Would you agree there's a conceptual distinction between brain and mind? Yes, except for the fact that the mind is generated by the brain. The mind does not exist separate from I the agree. brain. The mind, the I consciousness, agree. what we call our consciousness, yeah. is just another type of thinking, just like beliefs and, and feelings and emotions. Yeah. Uh, it's the product of our brains, so that's where yeah, I philosophy, start. They call that an, an, some some call it an epiphenomenon. 
Right. That'd be phenomenal. Fine. I don't ask me how it's created. I know that it's created in me because no, I feel it. Is, con but... Conceptually, the word mind or the concept for mind refers to a different phenomena or entity yes. in nature than the yes. concept of brain. Right. But I don't believe your mind, but you can't change your brain. I believe that that my consciousness is, as you say, an epiphenomenon. I do not believe that my consciousness exists or will exist separate from my brain. When my brain stops functioning, my consciousness will disappear. No, I agree with that, of course. Okay, but, but you and I agree with that. But uh, most people are theists and others who even are atheists and maybe, let's stick to theists, believe that our, our soul, our consciousness, our spirit exists separate from our bodies and will continue right. to exist. And so it's easy for them to believe in free will. Because number one, they believe that there's this separate entity, not an epiphenomenon, but a phenomenon, a, a thing well, called okay. consciousness so, okay. that so, exists. Okay. Forget this the term. Forget the term. I don't Forget think. I don't think it makes. No, uh, your terms are fine, but I. I don't think it makes it easier. I think they think it makes it's, it easier, but it's so it's much sort of easier. Like, it's sort of like <laughs> when you say, "When where did the universe begin?" And you and I would say, "We don't know." And right. they would say, oh, well, it started with God. And then if you yeah. say, well, where did God start? They say, I yeah. don't know. Uh, so yeah. they push no. the problem back. No, they don't. They right? say God it always existed. They don't say, I don't know. Well, whatever. But they, so but yeah. we can say that about can say the universe. So exists. listen, so, I, mean, I, didn't, I didn't write shallow drafts to convince theists that we don't have free will. I wrote shallow drafts to convince my fellow atheists that we don't have free will. And uh, as I was saying, it's easy for a theist to believe in free will because they believe that this consciousness that exists separate from our body, our minds separate from our body, and they believe in miracles. So they believe that this, this non-corporeal, non-physical thing called consciousness can somehow m modify and, and modulate okay, and affect okay, okay, the hold, neurons hold and the protons in our brains. I and agree, as, I agree. I, 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 they think there's a, a they think so this is where i was going to go with that god analogy they believe in a type of ontological dualism i would call it so they think or maybe more than dualism but they think there's two realms of reality they think there, there's a spiritual realm but they also think there's a connection between the spiritual realm and the physical realm like so right. they think like there's a soul up there in heaven right and it's somehow connected to a body somehow right right like right. whatever you the right. details are, are, are boring if but the point is you never escape the dilemma of of free will because even if you it doesn't matter what the realm is i mean maybe maybe our realm is really spiritual i mean if you look at the atoms we're really empty space all the way down so maybe we are spirits in a certain sense so it it doesn't matter if you transform or imagine the second realm of spirits um now, your word miracle is interesting because to my mind, the word miracle is similar to the word faith. That's one reason I have trouble with you using it as a substitute for knowledge because you're using it as trust, and trust is a perfectly fine no. way of, 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 of acquiring knowledge from other people who are, are experts in something so or have studied mi something. A miracle is the suspension of physical processes, right? It's, so it's, it's, is faith. A, it's faith is the belief in something with no reason. <laughs> no, so it's, it's the not. Of something with you, no, no causes. You're They're being, the same thing. You're, you're be, I have faith that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet. I don't know that Shakespeare wrote that, Hamlet. But that's not what the word means. It is. It, it's, it, 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 it's the. But you the have, point. I would say you have. If, a, you it, have a good reason to believe that. That's what I would say. I'm saying what I'm saying is is that my brain performs the exact same process in going from my evidence about Shakespeare to my conclusion about Shakespeare as the, psych Shakespeare as the psychological process that takes me from evidence for or against the existence of God big, to a conclusion. Dude, you could say my brain performs the same experience when I, when I experience an endorphin rush when I'm parachuting out of an airplane because it's all mechanical. I mean, you're acquiring right. things that, that right. they're not they're not the same. They are the They're same. The, the process is the same. But, they, but by that free, but by that reasoning, the thing that happens in a cricket's brain is the same as it happens in your brain because they're all causal. I mean, you're, yep. you're you're emitting too many fine nuances that distinguish things. When we I talk don't think about so. Conceptual reason. I don't. I don't know whether crickets 
have consciousness or not. Maybe they do, maybe they don't, I don't know. I, I assume, frankly, that you have consciousness. I don't know that to be the case, but I assume that since you and I are both you human know beings. You know, so what does it mean? To, you know it in the sense of you have a reason to be certain about that. You have well, I, I, I'm confident. Not certain, but I'm confident. I know. So I know. So you want to do everything on a spectrum, like degrees. That's this is why you won't say you know there's not a god. You want to say, well, you're like Harris and these four horsemen guys who, oh, <laughs> well. So no. Far, what are you no talking about? For god. Hey, Steve. There never could be evidence for god. You know that. <laughs> of course, there could, How could be. How could there be evidence for god? How could there be evidence for for an omnipotent, immortal being? If How would got, even he know he's immortal? If you got struck by lightning for saying that. That would be evidence for God. It wouldn't be conclusion. Totally. It wouldn't be proof, no, but it would be I, evidence for. Huh? I, well, that, I, this is where we disagree. I don't think that – I think the idea of God is totally impossible because part of God's definition is he knows – say he's, um, he's, he's omniscient. So he would have to know he's God, which means he'd have to be immortal. He'd have to know he's immortal. He'd have to be omnipotent and know he's omnipotent. But the problem is – even if you were omnipotent and even if you were immortal, you could never know that because tomorrow there could be a super god above you that was yanking your strings the whole time, which, by the way, is one of the early Christian uh, beliefs that, that uh, some of these Christian heretics believe that Paul hijacked the faith and that all the Christians were worshiping this, this sort of fake under god who thought he was god, but there's another god above him. But you can never – you can never – uh, you can never be surprised at the lengths to which these mystics will go. They will come up with all kinds of crazy shit. And the okay. Christians are not even the worst. I, I mean, I've been reading about Islam lately. If you read into the uh, like the the, thir the thirteeners and Islam, uh, most Islam is even crazier. And of course, Judaism has its own, uh, and all they all do. They all have their crazy stuff. Yes, it's sir. Incredible to me. They would just yes. make up one thing after the other. Yes. So let me just. Uh, I, I, tangent, but. Well, okay. So maybe maybe God's possible. Maybe God's not possible. You and I believe God does not exist. Now you say you know God well, exists. I believe fine. He doesn't exist. You're not persuaded. He. he no, I, I believe. I believe. I have beliefs. You're I don't. Just not sure. Right. I'm not sure. So that I'm not sure that Shakespeare wrote Shakespeare. Possible. There could be. A guy that knows he's going to live forever. You think that's possible? Yeah, I think that's possible. How? How could you? How could you know <laughs> that... you're going to live forever? Seriously, tomorrow <laughs> hasn't come yet. How do you know you're going to be alive tomorrow? I, you and I, I don't know. An asteroid's not going to I... wipe out the earth tomorrow, right? <laughs> we don't right. know that gravity is going to stop working tomorrow. We don't know that. True. True. I believe so that that's not true. Know? I believe that that's not true. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I. I. I we're going to have to agree to disagree about whether God is even possible. Okay. Yeah, so basically you're the theist here. <laughs> no, <laughs> the no. I, hang on, I'm moving over because the sun is, is getting in the way. No, I used to be a theist. I used to be a theist. And then the evidence that I had in my possession changed over time. And my brain automatically and involuntarily switched from me being a theist to an atheist that happened over Why time. Why automatically and voluntarily, uh, involuntarily agree that I'm right right now and we'll be done with this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, if I only could, <laughs> I would. <laughs> so, maybe but let me go back to the, let me go back to- Maybe in let me five go, minutes you're gonna change your mind. Let me just go back to justice for a second. So I said that justice. at the individual level, it's unfair to punish somebody for transgressing when they had no yep. free will. By the same token, it's unfair to reward somebody for doing good. If they had no free will, it's unfair to do so that? when Who there is a that? in a limited uh, what? Who does that? Who rewards Who people does for doing well? Well, if your boss, if you do a good job, he gives you a raise. Yeah, so you're you're basically trying to come up with an argument against capitalism. Go ahead. No, no, you're missing my point. My point is is that there's an inherent unfairness to treating people better or worse based on their actions, Desert, yeah. over yeah, yeah. which they had no free will, no conscious control. Um, well, again, whether that's deterministic or random, it doesn't matter. But like Sam Harris, I think that there is a societal justification for punishing transgressors and rewarding 
good doers because we want to encourage them and we want to encourage others and discourage that's them always, and discourage that's always others. been part of the argument that's, that's so like, right for centuries that's been part of the argument right but not the part that says that it, it's inherently wrong to do that at the individual level right what's the difference whether you think if, it's inherently wrong or not or whether you just don't <clears throat> Like you, well, Steve Mendelson, don't I, want I, people running around raping and murdering and pillaging and looting. But I do think that having that appreciation of the lack of free will will temper and 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 modify and 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 reduce the punishments and reduce make the rewards. Yeah, make us more compassionate. Absolutely. And yeah, but, but you and, still you still keep alighting the difference. I mean, you're talking about treating people, but treating is an action too. And so the people that are treating are determined too. So I don't know what you're – are you saying well, I want you people to choose to listen to no, me no. and I am, therefore be nicer to criminals? I'm talking because I read Sam Harris, and that tipped my scale. And whatever's motivating me automatically and involuntarily to talk now is, is, is spreading that word uh, to others. And if it has the effect of, of, of having them automatically and voluntarily ch change their minds about these issues, that's the, way, that's the way this whole process works. People communicating with one another, and that's how evidence changes over time. And that's and how the beliefs way, change just, over time. By the way, just to let you know, I, I agree with almost everything you've been saying. I agree with all this. I'm just giving you sort of a devil's advocate. But, no, that's fine. Uh, I agree that we should – although from a criminal point of view, I would be more on the macroscopic level. I would say, listen, almost like almost everyone you hear of that is a horrible psychopath or, or, or sociopath or criminal, they're almost always like – from a poor family, they were abused by their parents. There's always a reason. There's always a cause, right? Or almost even a physical brain defect. Yeah. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't incapacitate some people. I do think right. that, like, I mean, I've I've written right. stuff on this. Uh, there's a, there's right. different theories of punishment, whether right. it should be restitution, retribution, rehabilitation, rehabilitation, incapacitation. I tend to think incapacitation is the most uh, justifiable and self-defense. Um, restitution, retri re rehabilitation, retribution, no, they're less. And I actually think in a libertarian, stateless, free market order, you would tend to have a voluntary system without even any prisons mostly. And you would rely upon voluntary ostracism and things like that. There's a whole literature on this, which is fascinating. But it's about giving people an opportunity to reintegrate back into society, pay your debts, do what you got to do, apologize. Yeah. I, I don't know if I've talked to you about this before, but there's something about this uh, the Jewish idea of uh, what do you call it, repentance? Yeah. Which the Christians Shuvah. sort of. Yeah, the Christians like remember remember that black church that was shot the black Christian church that was shot up by this white racist guy a few years ago. Yeah, and yeah. All the black people they gave they forgave him. Yeah. It's like, well, no, they haven't he, really. He didn't, ask, he didn't ask for forgiveness, right? Right. No. He didn't even read. ask for it. Like I, I love the, the the Jewish idea that okay, you have to like admit what you did wrong, admit the harm you did, offer something to make it up, and humbly ask for. Repent and ask for right. forgiveness and, uh, well, and offer some kind of – you know, right. so to me, that makes total logical sense, and I think that's roughly the way a justice system would work. Now, so, I do think there would be some people that would be the supermax type of DC criminals that would be – you'd either have to just kill them, or they would just be killed by the family of the victims, you know, and no one would turn an eye, or they'd be ostracized or outcast to, to Coventry or to Australia. You know what I mean? Something like yeah. that. Uh, but well, other than that, the whole penal system is totally, uh, totally screwed. And I totally yeah. so I, I I basically agree with you on slightly different reasons. But um, yeah, but it's not because I wouldn't say it's because people, you know, if if you rape and murder a young child or something horrible, even if there's an excuse or a reason for it, it's sort of like when the family dog mauls the baby, you got to put the dog down. Even if well, as I as I write in my book, when the when the lion kills a, a a zookeeper, why do you have to put the lion down? 
That's, that's well, what lions do. That's I, I, what I don't lions know the science are. behind that, but I think there's a. I think I don't know about that, but I do think if you have a pit bull that kills a baby, yeah. Then, but you're not doing it for retribution. You're not doing it to punish no, the no, no, dog. You're, doing, you're doing it to prevent and, and, the dog from hurting others. And that's the same yes, thing. I, retribution, as Sam Harris says, retribution is not a valid reason for punishing. It's not to punish the past activity. It's to prevent future bad activity. Although there, there is a book. It's an interesting book. It's, the title is called Getting Even. And um, that's, I forgot. That's uh, Woody Allen's book. <laughs> no, it's not. Him. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a philosopher, it's... political philosopher. But he explains why, even though liberal-minded people like us, yeah, you might tend to think retribution is kind of retrograde and not really the the humanitarian or the social or, or the or the or the, or the, or the or the civilized way of dealing with crime. There are actually reasons that retribution has been and maybe could be justified as being integrated into the system. It's something to do with – it's like catharsis and all this kind of stuff. I'm, because I'm it makes you feel better. <laughs> yeah, I guess. Well, it makes the, it makes the victims feel better. There are some victims, victims who want to victims, see their, right. their daughter's murder executed in the electric. Right, room. right. And who are we to say that it doesn't actually give them some relief? Uh, I'm not saying the cost it is does. worth it. I think the cost yeah. is not worth it. Um, that's, but yeah. It's not dismissible, I think. Well, that's where the tempering of punishment and reward come in as a result of appreciating this lack of free will that we all have. I, um, I agree with you. I think that uh, appreciating our influences in life, uh, like I said, most people that are psychopaths, you can point to something that happened to them when they were children. Or Absolutely. Yep. Yep. Which is one reason I'm against spanking. I don't know if you are, but um, I'm against corporal punishment and all these types of the ways we raise our children. There's a whole movement in libertarianism called peaceful parenting, and they they I've become more of a, more and more of an inheritor of that. Yeah. Well, makes um, sense. Uh, mostly because of my Montessori stuff early on, but um, yeah, I think. <laughs> If you spank your children as a way to get them to do what you think is right, and you're supposed to be their protector, and you're the big, powerful parent adult, what do you expect is going to do to them psychologically? Yeah. Now, I don't yeah. think it's the end of the world. No. I know, but you, I was spanked a few times, and as they say, I turned out okay. But you know, <laughs> there's probably ra there's probably rape victims who turned out okay, but that uh -huh. doesn't make mean it's okay. Right, right. The, the right. question is, is it a, is it the right and moral way to and it's the same thing as the punishment system, by the way. It's, it's like, is punitive or punitive negative measures the right way to rear children? Anyway, I think if we want less psychopaths and sociopaths, we should not traumatize them when they're young. That's got to be part of it. Yeah, I'm with you. It makes it difficult to um, figure out how to tread, though, right? If you're constantly cons worried about what what the lasting implications of everything that you do might might have, <laughs> it gets to be very uh... well. Yeah, and that's not that's a different concern. <laughs> I mean, of course, uh, that's the way life is. That everything you do reduces the uh, has an opportunity cost, which means that it forecloses some possibilities in the future, right? And as you go through life, then you've now foreclosed. Like you and I will never be on the Olympic team doing something because anything. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, we're not 21 years old or whatever. Yeah, you know, we're we're not going to be medical doctors now because we've already foreclosed that option by the paths. But no, but I'm talking about just, I'm not talking about personal opportunities. I'm talking about the effect that you have on others. You know, when you're raising know, your kid but, but, and you're deciding, okay, do I give in and give them the bubble gum now or do I not? What's the no, lasting and, impact that's going to have on this kid? Well, you know, and you, I'm not so, saying that you shouldn't punish your kids because it will have an impact because everything you do has an impact. I'm simply right. saying the science of child rearing and the science or the, whatever you want to call it, the, the morality of the situation um, uh, militates against a punitive method, just well, like it, what you're saying. I mean, but, it, but, and, and, but then again, that has to be based on statistics, right? You have to look at what no, has happened in the past. This monist evidence thing. Stop me, me. The nature of me, you're the one who was talking about Pachinko. 
I'm the one saying that. <laughs> well, that was a, that's a physical system. To I'm determine whether games. spanking, to determine whether spanking is good or bad, you got to look at people who've been spanked and who haven't, and, and look and see what the effects are. See, I, huh? I agree that can help, but no, to me, it's more of it's more of a humanitarian thing. It's it's. No, you just made an argument that we shouldn't punish people for committing crimes because they don't really choose to do the crimes. It's well, unfair the to them. Parents, it's unfair to them at the individual level to do so. Yes. At, at so the why, society why level, the parents, it's a justification. No, I mean, why do parents spank their children? Because they say the kid did the wrong thing. He needs right. to be punished to learn his lesson. Right, so he won't like, do well, it again. Yeah, but the kid probably did what was natural at his stage of development. Of course it was. It absolutely was, because he doesn't have free will either. Shitty, no, but he didn't have free will. He didn't have free will either. It doesn't matter. Whether we have free will or not, we still respond to stimuli and respond and, and environment. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. Yep. Can't help it. Exactly. No free will. <laughs> I think we're more to, we're pretty much agreement. Okay, we got to sort it out. I think so. I do want to mention compatibilism because you used that term earlier and that's not the context that I've heard it used in discussing free will. When Daniel Dennett talks about compatibilism, he's talking about determinism and free will being compatible. And that is bullshit. What they do is they conflate free will with freedom and they talk about autonomous beings. Yeah. So that's not free will. Free will isn't freedom from uh, influence of others. Free will is, 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 is the ability for your consciousness to control your behavior. And I think, I think I that might be right. I haven't read, I read Sam Harris's footnoted criticisms of Dennett on that, but I haven't read Dennett himself on compatibilism. And I know that the, the standard uh, philosophical defense of compatibilism is um, – it's all over the map, number one, and it's not the same as mine. Like I said, I, I try to cobble together something based upon my appreciation of, of dualism, which is the Mises idea that we understand different phenomena in the universe by different modes of cognition and reasoning. So we argue about economic and – teleological phenomena using re deductive reasoning from the inside. And we argue about and understand causal laws, the physical laws of the world using the scientific method, to, be, to put it crudely. Um, well, speaking, speaking of Daniel Dennett, can I read right. to you the epilogue from Shallow Drafts? Sure. On February 9th, 2017, I went to the Free Library of Philadelphia to hear Daniel Dennett speak about his new book, From Bacteria to Bach and Back, The Evolution of Minds. Professor Dennett had just finished discussing the illusion of consciousness when the moderator opened the program to questions from the audience. I was lucky enough to be called on first. Although I had decided what I was going to ask Professor Dennett a day or two before the program, I still fumbled my delivery. I started well enough. Speaking of illusion, I said, do you still believe, um, I mean, does your brain still automatically and involuntarily make you believe that you have free will? Notwithstanding their shared title as two of the four new atheists, along with Richard Dawkins and the late great Christopher Hitchens, Professor Dennett and Sam Harris have had some heated disagreements about free will. Bottom line, Sam says no and Dan says yes. I must say that I found Professor Dennett's answer to my admittedly obnoxious question rather disingenuous. Basically, his answer was something to the effect of, it wait, depends. Wait, wait. So, is this, who's this talk? Is this you talking? This is me. This is my book. I'm so reading you were it there. to you. I was there. I know. I'm, I'm I, looking. I've got your book on the, on the screen. Yeah, page 207. I asked him a question. Yeah, I said, does, right does your brain, and then he responded, it depends what you mean by free will. If you mean the kind of free will that implies that we are not responsible for our actions, then who would want to believe in that kind of no free will? Yeah, yeah. I wish the moderator had given me an opportunity to respond to his answer. And if I had had such an opportunity, I wish that I had thought fast enough to come up with the following response. But he did not, and I did not, so I'm left with writing it here. 
That's very disingenuous of you, Danny, I would have said. I'm not a big fan of cancer and my own mortality, but just because they both have unpleasant implications, that doesn't mean that cancer doesn't exist or that I'm not going to die. Would you, as one of the four new atheists, accept as ingenuous the following argument from a theist? If you mean the kind of world without a God, then who would want to believe in that kind of world? the end I so agree with, yeah, yeah i got it on the screen here yeah i agree with you by the way i, I, I agree totally <laughs> thanks for with indulging you. me this is <laughs> this is the problem with my i've had with these these guys uh they're all i'm lumping them together but they're all scientific in my sense like they're all monist um they're all ultimately well harris tries to be philosophical but they're all ultimately empiricist right and that's my main problem is there's no appreciation for this this role of of reason as a source of knowledge and a, a contextual appreciation of how we acquire certainty in life right in knowledge um i think i can work with empiricists because they they by and large stumble towards the right things except when they get caught up in the latest hysteria like global warming or COVID or something, you know, <laughs> or eugenics. <laughs> but Imagine by that. and large, it, they're steered Ooh. in the right direction by by reality, the laws of, of reality. Um, what can you say? Well, anyway, here's what I say. I quote Richard. I, it is. I, I, I quote Richard Dawkins numerous times in my book. Um, this is his statement. If something is true, no amount of wishful thinking can undo it. So if we don't have free will, that might not be comfortable, that might not be comforting, but just because it's not comfortable doesn't mean it isn't true. And no yeah, amount of wishful thing thinking. Uh, yeah. Same thing with God. Same thing with death. I want to believe in a world without God, yeah. By the way, that's not the actual end of my book. Keep going a couple pages later, and you'll see. Oh, you got to go 30 more pages well, down. I see the joke. I see the joke. There it is. Yeah, that's my favorite joke. Did you hear about the one-armed fisherman? Caught a fish this big. Well, you know the other joke about this. How do you get a one-armed? Uh, how do you get a one-armed guy in a, caught in a tree to, to to get out of the tree? Ask him to clap. What? Yeah, you wave. Give at him a high five. Wave to him. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Very good. Politically incorrect as always. <laughs> All right. I think we've done enough damage today. How about That's this? That's good. Are you okay with it? I'm, I, I love it. Well, I'll record it. I mean, it's record if, if it worked right. If not, yeah. Uh oh. We're going to have to do the whole thing again. Take two. They won't know that this is already take two. We did this all week. No. <laughs> you got to watch it. You got trust. Do you ever watch uh, science fiction or television? Uh, well, it depends what you mean, but no, not much. Watch like Netflix series. I watch Fox News every once in a while. That's no, you gotta science watch fiction. Debs, trust me, Tr Steve. Trust me, you gotta watch Debs. What's it? What's it called? Debs. Debs D E B S. Like, oh, not D E B, not Eugene V. No, Debs. It means Debs. developers, but it actually means something else. As you oh, Debs. You okay. Uh, it's it's. What is it on Netflix? You said. First. It's on Hulu. Oh, okay. I have to get my son it's to show me how to do. Free will. It's literally about quantum computing free will, uh, uh, physics, uh, choice, determinism, that's it. but in a weird science, it's crazy. Well, that's when pe people, people ask me, people ask me whether my, uh, book shallow drafts is fiction or nonfiction. I say it, de it depends who you are. We have to wait and see. <laughs> right. Right. Okay. Well, why don't we do this? Uh, I'll, I'll stop. I'm going to stop now. Say goodbye to Kinsella's people. Bye. Thank you, Kinsella people. All right. Stop sharing. Uh, I stopped recording. Oh, no, I didn't. I stopped sharing. Hold on. I didn't stop recording. Hold on. And I didn't do anything.